According to the World Bank, nearly 60,000 people die each year in natural disasters, mostly in developing countries. Most of these deaths are due to building collapses and earthquakes. After an earthquake, areas can be inaccessible, making it difficult to search for survivors and for survivors to find potable water. This makes robots and drones the perfect tool to search for survivors after an earthquake. In fact, one of the largest drone manufacturers in the world recently said that one properly equipped drone can find a missing person up to five times faster than traditional search methods. That's just one drone. Imagine what two, 10, or even a swarm of 100 drones could do. Right now, each drone is operated by a single trained pilot, which tells the drone exactly what to do. Imagine if instead that pilot could control that entire swarm of drones, or even better, if that entire swarm of drones could work autonomously on their own without a trained pilot. In developing countries where a trained drone pilot might be hours away, local first response teams can deploy an autonomous team of aerial robots to search for survivors and tell them where to go immediately after a natural disaster, saving many more lives. I've been working on these kinds of complex problems of how to get teams of robots to work together for more than a decade. And it's deceptively difficult to get robots to work together. But we have big dreams. We want robots to search for survivors after earthquakes. We want robots to contain forest fires. We want them to deliver medicine to areas in need. But these environments are very different than the environments that, that, that we've trained the robots in. So we've solved very similar problems to these. So in this example, this is a video from my lab where we're doing a demonstration of, of drones flying through windows. So we've been successful in labs, in manufacturing and warehousing facilities, and even in entertainment. But these environments, like I said, are very different. And so we're dreaming big, but something is holding us back. And I believe it's how we solve the problem. It's a really big challenge to get a team of robots to work together on search and rescue. In fact, it's the biggest challenge I've faced in my career. I want you to think back to the biggest challenge you've ever faced. Did you solve it entirely on your own? Or did you work in a group or ask other people for advice? I know that when I work on a big challenge, I ask as many people as I can. I try to get as many opinions from people who've been through it and people who haven't, people who are my senior and people who are my junior, people in my field, people outside my field. I collect as many ideas as I can, and then I take the best of those ideas that work for me. And so we work in groups so that we can take advantage of the diversity in our experiences and in our knowledge so that we can come up with better solutions. But when I think about how we actually try to get robots to work together, we're not applying this. Right now, what we do is we have our problem, like search and rescue. It's very complicated, so we try to make it simpler by making assumptions. Like, the building is made of a certain kind of material, or the earthquake is going to be of a certain type or a certain size. And then we optimize the solution based on those assumptions, and we deploy it on all of the robots. The trouble is that the world rarely meets our expectations. And so when one of those robots fails, all of them are going to fail. So we're not applying what comes as second nature to ourselves, trying to come up with diverse solutions so that they work better. And so if humans are so good at this, then why can't we learn from humans? Roboticists have been studying animals like birds, fish, ants, and lions to try to figure out how they collaborate on tasks so that we can observe them and actually apply those learnings to robots. But we can actually communicate with humans. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. 
As you may already know, robots are nothing like humans. Humans have very different ways of communicating. Just a facial expression or a hand gesture can communicate something to you. Robots can't do that. Their communication is much less expressive and much more intentional. Robots can communicate by broadcast. So for example, if you heard over the speakers right now somebody saying, follow me, if you don't know where that's coming from, how would you know what to do? Robots can also communicate by address. That's like maybe one of your friends in the audience sending you a text message saying, come over here. Now, as a human, you might be able to figure out where your friend is by using context. But robots don't have that capability. And so communicating within a large team of robots becomes really difficult because they need to share a lot more information than we're used to. That uses up all of our bandwidth so that we can't use it for more important things. Beyond communication, robots also see the world in an entirely different way. In this video, you can see the world from a robot's perspective. It's really hard for us as humans to understand what's going on in this video. But the robot is actually using this information to complete its task. And so if we expect robots to be able to use this small amount of information to do complex things, it's no wonder that we haven't been able to do things like use teams of robots for search and rescue. So I thought about this for a very long time. How can we actually get humans? How can we get robots to act more like humans? But we can't really do that because they're so different. So instead, what we decided to do is to actually use interfaces to change how humans act so humans can act more like robots. And so we developed a multiplayer game in order to learn how humans coordinate on complex tasks. And we gave them very robot-like capabilities. So in this game, each player, they're all human players, is represented by a single dot on the screen. There are many other people playing at the same time. But much like you can only see a limited field of view of people seated around you, we only allow them to see a limited field of view. And much like the person next to you blocks what you see beyond them, we also include this kind of occlusion. We allow the people to move up, down, left, and right. And then we ask them to do tasks like form rectangles and circles together. Note that I didn't mention that we give people any kind of communication. So we already talked about why communication is difficult. So we don't include any communication in this game. So to give you an idea of what it's like to play the game, if you're playing the game, you're the red dot in the center here. And all the other black parts are controlled by other people. So this is not a computer game. This is people actually playing the game. And so you can see in this small example that it's kind of, you can kind of understand what's going on. And so in a small group with this little amount of information, it's actually easy to form a rectangle. But now I'm going to show you what it looks like in a larger group. But to give you a better understanding of what that looks like, I'm going to show it to you from an overhead view so you can see all of the players. Know that the players here only see that small circle around them as well. So we ask these players to also form a rectangle. And so in the beginning, what happens is because people can't see each other, they start forming rectangles in different locations. And eventually, one guy in the large group in the center figures out there aren't enough people there, will try to go out and find the other people, but doesn't go far enough. Someone from the other group does the same thing, goes far enough, and then is able to actually go back and recruit the other players using motion alone. No communication, just motion. And so people play the game very differently. So some of them form groups, some of them are passive, some of them are active, some of them are explorers. And all these different personalities combine to make the game actually work. And so from this game, we're learning how humans coordinate on these kinds of tasks so that we can better apply this to robots. You might be asking me, couldn't I just come up with a controller that would get the robots to form a perfect rectangle every time? The answer is yes. Just like if I could train a team of aerial robots 
to search the same exact building that's collapsed after an earthquake, and they'd be perfect at it every time. But change that building, change the location, change the materials. It's not going to work. And this is why diversity is necessary. We need to take different solutions and combine them. So if we have robots that are trained on different kinds of buildings, then one of them is bound to work, and the others can learn from that one. So instead of taking our problem and making a set of assumptions and applying it to all of our robots, instead, we should come up with different solutions that have different strengths, combine the best ones, and use those on the team of robots. This way, if one of them fails, they can actually learn from the others. And so this actually goes well beyond just having robots form circles and rectangles. Diversity is extremely important. And what we're learning through this game is how diversity works by studying how humans use it. And so with this information, we can actually learn how much diversity is necessary and whether it's different for different tasks so that we can take robots out of our labs and warehouses and manufacturing facilities and put them in these complex environments like search and rescue or um, any kind of outdoor example. So imagine in a developing country after a natural disaster that a local first response team can deploy a team of aerial drones to search for survivors and tell them where to go. Those hours or minutes even that it saves can help us change the statistics dramatically. But this goes well beyond search and rescue. Having teams of robots that can take advantage of diversity will allow us to do deep sea exploration. They'll allow us to monitor our aging infrastructure and even take teams of robots to space. The sky is the limit. As the late Maya Angelou said, in diversity, there is beauty and there is strength. Our differences are what make us unique and will make us valuable. And we need to embrace that. Let's teach our robots to do the same thing so that together we can change the statistics. Thank you.